Okay, so 1 Kings. We are there in 1 Kings chapter 11. I am in 2 Chronicles. I need to get to the right book. Not even the right number. Not even the right number. So, we had just gotten into chapter 11 this past Sunday evening, and um, we discussed a little bit about how Solomon had a problem, it seemed, with uh, being content with just a little bit of things. As a matter of fact, he had to have a whole lot of everything, it seemed, and even to the point that it was the same with his wives. He had uh, 700 wives and 300 concubines in the text as we read through, stated that this was the very thing that turned his heart away from God. He would then lend into and accept the idolatrous practices of his many wives. And it went even beyond just the accepting of this, but rather we'll see that Solomon also then begins to promote idolatry is what we're going to see as we work our way through the text. It was more than him just saying, okay, yeah, this is okay. I'll accept it in my house in Jerusalem even. But now I'm even going to do things to help prolong, to give longevity to the very acts of idolatry. Big problem, major turning point for the kingdom, for all of God's people. And from this point forward, we're going to remember it it just continues to go downhill from here. Now, we'll pick up there in verse 7 and read verses 7 through 10 just for a little reminder, and then we'll jump right on into verses 11 and following. Um, 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 7, it says, Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from following the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord had commanded him. Now, we discussed this a little bit, and one of the quotes I brought out um, as we were getting ready to wrap up on Sunday evening was a man who wrote this. He said, No hill about Jerusalem was free from a chapel of devils. Solomon is bringing these things very close to home. It's within his household because it's something he's allowing his wives to take part in. And now he's fixing to build, the text says, he builds these altars so that this can happen right there near Jerusalem. I think we discussed last uh, or on Sunday evening the location where many believe as far as where he actually built this first altar east of Jerusalem. Does anybody remember where we said? Or did I say? Maybe I didn't get as far as I thought I did. That could be too. The Mount of Olives. Right? Just across the valley. I I wonder even if it was the case at any point that you could see, because remember, it did state the one verse that we had in like the last chapter and a half that says that Solomon still offered these sacrifices to God three times a year. I wonder if it was ever the case that you could see the smoke coming from the altar there where the temple is and at the same time see smoke coming off of these other altars. That's what Solomon has done and what he's brought to the people of God. He allowed it in his household. He accepted it. And now it's gotten to the point where he's also promoting it. Now, if Solomon, we don't have a direct text that says Solomon actually went over to this other hilltop after this altar was built. We don't have a text that says that he went over there and actually offered sacrifices on that altar. Was he still in the wrong? Absolutely, right? He's giving them some legs to stand on. He's giving idolatry legs to stand on there in Jerusalem. He's causing a major problem. And this was a man who was so wise, so understanding, who should have known the Word of God. How many times does the text say that he was told even by God? Twice. You know, it's one thing, a lot of the time you see in the Old Testament with some of these um, occasions, I'll say like this, you'll have a prophet come and they'll, they'll relay word to whoever it is that God wants the message to be delivered to, saying, look, you better not do this or you better do this. It wasn't the case. It wasn't a prophet, right? Solomon received this word from the Lord through a dream. Here's what I need you to not do. Don't do this two times. Not to mention David even told him the same things. 
Remember before David passed, he said, here's what you need to do. Keep your focus on God. Serve him, live by his commandments, keep his statutes, walk in his ways, and you'll be good. Now, what's he do? Now he's got an altar built on a hill right across the valley on the next hilltop over, just east of Jerusalem. Things have really turned, and they're fixing to get a whole lot worse as we continue to work through the text. Any thoughts or questions before we move into verse 11 and following? Yes, sir. This whole thing back in Deuteronomy 31, it said that they were supposed to read these laws mm -hmm. every seven years at the Feast of the Tabernacle. That's right. Yeah. And you know, it should have been very obvious to them. Right. If they had not discontinued that practice. That's right. And, um, you know, there are many who believe that as far as when the temple was completed, that would have, they were all coming together for the Feast of the Tabernacles. And it is assumed that it was possibly on that seventh year. And maybe that's why you hear so much of the law actually in Solomon's prayer because it was fresh on their minds, fresh in their ears. And he would have heard them things very recently, read those things. Well, it should have been known. Um, and if it is the case that they had just experienced all of that and heard all of that, now, I don't know how much time has lapsed. We're not exactly told those things, but here he is turning far away from the Lord. Now, it does state that he was old in his age just as much later in his life. Nonetheless, he knew, right? He understood what he was supposed to do and what he was not supposed to do. Okay, if someone will go ahead and read verses 11 through 13 for us. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Because you have done this, and have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days, for the sake of your father David. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Thank you. So here's what you can expect, Solomon. You were told again and again and again, and now you disobeyed. Here's what you can expect. Now, even within this justice that is going to be served, and the Lord is very angry with Solomon, there's also something else that you see, one of the attributes of God seen in these three verses. Even though, yes, his anger is aroused, what else do we see in these three verses about God's character, about his nature? Mercy. Mercy, right? He says, look, this is what's going to take place. Now, he's going to extend it, and he says it's not going to happen while you're reigning, but rather it's going to happen while your son reigns. And then he links that back to who? David, right? He remembers David's heart. He remembers how David served him and did not turn away from him. And he says, because of this, I'm not going to tear it out while you are still here, but rather when your sons come in to reign. Yes, sir. He also shows his faith. Mm -hmm. And that's something very important to us because I mean, God's going to be faithful. That's right. And, and faithful to those who are faithful to him. Mm -hmm. And he's faithful to David. And, and because of that faithfulness to David, now Solomon's getting the benefits of God's faithfulness even though he doesn't deserve it. Yep. So, which shows mercy. You're three sub points ahead of me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. You got the, got the, the mind thinking. That's a good thing. Um, so, what he. he he specifies within this, and we're going to come back to what Aaron was saying, and it's a good point uh, to draw out as to why God, you know, is extending this mercy, and you see his faithfulness even back to David in this. But he says there in verse 11 that he has not, Solomon has not kept his covenant nor his statutes, which he had commanded him. He will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Verse 12, nevertheless... I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Now verse 13, he says, However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem. What tribe are we talking about here? Judah, Judah right? Now what's the significance? 49, 10. 49, Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10, right? The, the, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. So even within the punishment or justice that's going to be rendered because of Solomon's disobedience, there is still that seed line, that, that promise, even tied back to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7 in the Davidic promise, right? 
there was a promise made that there is one coming through this seed line who's going to uh, reign, and he's going to reign over an eternal kingdom, tying all the way to Acts chapter 2 in the sermon preached by Peter. So even with the messianic overtones, God's faithfulness will continue, even as Aaron was stating, because these are things that were promised all the way back to David. Even further back, take it all the way back to the garden in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. So God's faithfulness, faithfulness continues even through these things. Now, let's move. Question, thoughts? Good. We're going to try. Yes, sir. You say it goes all the way back, but it also goes all the way forward to yes. us today. His faithfulness that, mm -hmm. that Jesus is reigning and that through his raising him from the dead that we have the opportunity to be raised from the dead as well. And I just find that that when you piece this whole this whole history book, this great book of love together and you see it all and then you see the application for us today that, that you know, so many people think, well, God, how could God love me because I'm such a sinner? I mean, look at look at this whole book full of sinners that God's loved and, and, and carried along because of his promise to mankind. I mean, right. It is. It, when you follow the, uh, the uh, scheme of redemption, you know, from the very beginning all the way to the end, it, it is a beautiful... Um, I don't want to say story, but at the same time, it's a long-running narrative, right, that goes all the way even to us today. Uh, yes, sir. You know, I think God teaches not only future lessons like immediate man's immediate uh, selfishness and what he wants to do today. The punishment not only is an impact right now, but in the future come for man to reflect upon like do wrong it may not just be you know an immediate correction or punishment it's something that can extend on even past your own life right. and your own family you know God has appeared to him twice and yet he built altars for all all of his work wives to, to make them happy and having their own altar to sacrifice to their own gods. And he had the tangible vision of seeing God twice. No tangible uh, validation of all the <coughs> foreign uh, gods that his wives were worshiping. Mm -hmm. There was no appearance of obviously their <coughs> gods or any tangible thing to look at say that 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 God or their gods are real. Right. He had the God, the only God, in front of him twice. And then yet he said, I'm gonna and there's gonna be consequences now to some degree, but there's gonna be consequences on your family in the future. But because of my promise that I keep, you need to reflect upon the things that are gonna what you've done will impact future and your family. Absolutely. And you know, that, that still applies uh, so greatly today. You know, the choices that we make, the things that we do in our lives, uh, how much of an impact they can have even on our children, on our grandchildren, generations to come. Um, you know, and, and what seems to be a small thing can actually turn out to be something that runs through three generations before it's all said and done, right? So um, it's definitely the case that, uh, you know, He's not going to see every bit of this, but, you know, it's going to work its way through his son and on through the kingdom until it's, uh, well, we're fixing to see it divided, and then we're going to see Israel go, you know, into captivity, then Judah. So all of those things are going to take place, and it all starts here with this decision that Solomon made, a man who knew who the one true God was, or is, right? He knew, uh, had seen him, to your uh, point. He had seen him and spoke with him in a vision twice, and then still turns and accepts these things and then promotes these things even. Um, one thing I will say is something I saw in some of the reading. Um, these gods that are mentioned, you know, in the verses, even back up in verse uh, 5 through 7, um, building on a point made in the previous class is all of these are these gods of the Canaanites, gods of the, the people of the land of Canaan. Not one of these are any of the gods of Egypt. We don't find anywhere that that was the problem, that it came from Egypt, but rather from the land. Think about the warnings that God gave and how serious they were. Here's what's going to happen, and still, even Solomon would fall right into this stuff. 
All right. Let's go ahead and uh, read verses 14 through 17, if you will, and here's the results of this idolatry. Now the Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was a descendant of the king in Edom. For it happened when David was in Edom, and Joab, the commander of the army, had gone up to bury the slain after he had killed every male in Edom. Because for six months Joab remained there with all Israel until he had cut down every male in Edom. But Hadad fled to go to Egypt, he and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him. Hadad was still a little child. Thanks, sir. You know, this will kind of reflect on some of the things we discussed uh, Sunday morning in the Romans class, but think about how this is and how it states there in verse 14, now the Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon. How do we explain these kind of things when it, when it says the Lord raised up an adversary? God is, all the rulers and powers are ordained of God, even the despotic ones. They're, they're raised up by God to serve as a purpose. That's what we saw. Remember when Pilate interrogated Same Jesus I was at yeah. the cross, you know, and Jesus told him, the only power you have is what God has given to you, in other words. And so God raises, you know, he raises up these people, usually for the purpose of chastising his people who are not doing right, right. but they always pay for their sin. Right. These men were uh, able to be in these positions of authority because God allowed them to be in these positions. And the providence of God is still working through every bit of this. Is that what you're getting to, Eric? Yeah, the providence. And, and this doesn't negate free will. No, not at but all. But he aligned people because if this guy wouldn't have been done what God wanted him to do through him, then he would have raised up some, he would have providentially aligned someone else. Right. You know, yeah. so it's we can't negate the providence of God, but we also can't negate free will. Yeah, he had the he had the opportunity to choose uh, right. what he was going to do, and you know uh, that was actually something else I was going to state. So you're doing, I mean, you're killing me. No, you're good. You're good. I, I like it. I like it. I like it. You're good. Better my first comment that I was going to make about Solomon. How do you get so many wives when I can't even get one? But, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there are some comments we do just keep going. <laughs> I know, I know. I kept that to myself. That's what I'm And then I'm you let sure it jump out anyhow. Right oh. <laughs> so, it, you know, everyone involved still had the ability to choose for themselves. But the will of God is still moving forward, right? He did not remove any of them, their free will to choose in these matters. Remember, he had told Solomon, if you will follow my statutes, keep my commands, walk in my ways, I will maintain your kingdom. He told him that. If he would have done so, would he have maintained the kingdom? Absolutely. But God being all-knowing, he knew what was going to take place. And that's what's interesting when you look at some of these things, because if you look here in verses 14 through 17, it says he raised up this adversary against Solomon, Hadad, the Edomite. He was a descendant of the king of Edom. Now, when you start digging into who or when this is talking about, you're going all the way back during the reign of David, right? And as a matter of fact, what it said about this individual was he was a child when these things took place. So all the way back at this man's childhood, something took place that began this, um, feud's not the right word. Um, huh? I said slaughter. Slaughter? Well, that, that's, yeah. I mean, huh? Nemesis, well, right? Didn't he go back? Did David do a bunch of? Am I reading it wrong? Well, you're, yeah, what they did to them, what they did to the Edomites. And then like, yes. he killed all that little kid's people. Right, grudge was the word I was looking for because of what you were talking about—the slaughter that he took place. Yeah. Right, they killed every male. And then well, the kids ran. Right, so the kid leaves, and what the text states is that he leaves with these servants of a certain, uh, certain Edomites of his father's servants with him. Hadad was still a child. So this name, Hadad, from what I've studied on this, is kind of like a title more so than a name, um, a lot like what you would see Pharaoh. There were many Pharaohs. Well, Hadad seems to be uh, the leading figure title of these people. 
And back in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 8, we find an account where they go through and they, they wreak havoc on, um, on the Edomites and all these things that take place, I'm, that's what most believe is takes place there in 2 Samuel chapter 8. Can't say with certainty, but that's the idea. Well, with what was going on, this ruler's son escapes with some of the ruler's servants. And he flees, and we're fixing to see where it is he flees to. But it's still somewhat amazing when you think about this is something that took place in this boy's childhood. And even in that moment when David is still reigning, when he's still alive, and Joab is his commander, and they go into this location, and they slaughter all these people, all of a sudden this grudge forms, and now all these years later, the Lord raises up this adversary, this enemy that they have. Now remember, we're talking about after this time that's recognized as peace all in the land. They have peace on every side. So it's like these grudges that we're fixing to read about, they were something that were there in the minds of some, but they were held down low enough so it was still peace in the land, but now they have festered and they're coming to the surface. All because, well, Solomon has turned away and now these adversaries are going to be raised up. Yes, sir. And that, that goes to show how our own actions can affect others as well. Uh, because as long as everything was going good, then Solomon had peace throughout the land, so everybody's going to benefit from that. But as soon as that peace ends, it may not be everybody in the land, but there are going to be certain people and certain families that are going to feel the effect of these little you know, uh, skirmishes and things like that more than others. But ultimately, getting back to the point, it's because of Solomon. Right. And it's going to spread like a cancer. You know, it, it's... There was peace, and then as soon as he does wrong, like you're saying, and all of a sudden there's turmoil. All of a sudden there's problems. All that peace has come to an end, and now they're fixing to face problems because of his actions. And it begins to stem really from you know his accepting of the idolatry, but his also helping promote it. The people are also going to take to it, and we'll see that in the upcoming chapters as well. Yes, sir. Tying off of uh, what Mr. Preston said, I think it's interesting to see that um, whenever Solomon was making the right choices and making good decisions that his people profited from that. And then we see his downfall and his bad decisions and that his people suffer. They also suffered from that. Mm -hmm. And whatever he did, the people the people uh, took on the repercussions just the same as he did. Um, I think that's interesting. It is. Um, you know, one of those promises that were made to Solomon um, from the Lord was if you and it was very specific to Solomon and we discussed that as we worked through the text it was very specific to him if he would be obedient that things would go really well but if he turned things were going to go bad and we're starting to see that now and they reap the rewards of his doing good and now they're reaping the war, uh, rewards of his doing bad also yes sir and also not to always try to make Solomon the good guy but this goes all the way back to Joshua. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are all people, all these wives, all of these people should have never existed in the first place in the land for him to fall off into. Right. So, it, I mean, just talk about the consequences of actions of not taking the proper actions in the first place. Mm -hmm. This is generations and generations later that now even Solomon, he's put in this position of temptation because... They didn't do the right thing in the first place when they took the land to begin with. If they'd have drove which, them all out like they were supposed to originally, there wouldn't be any left for them. All right. the judges and all, I mean, all, you know, yeah. we just see this same cycle of turn to God, but not all the way. Right. Well, I'll do God's work as long as it doesn't mean killing everybody right. or leaving everything. And so they would, do, they would do it, get to just the point, and then, oh, well, we're good. And here we are hundreds of years later. No, not you're so not good. good. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I, yeah. I feel the same way with us today. We kind of, you know, it, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. And so I sympathize with Solomon, you know, not that much, but I sympathize with him because it's, it's a struggle. We, we get there and then, and then it's like, you know, uh, oh, a squirrel. And you get distracted. And, and next thing you know, yeah. you're, you're, you're struggling again. Yeah, I can only imagine if we were placed in such a position of power and wealth as Solomon, the mistakes that we would likely make just the same because of, you know, those great blessings. We could easily turn and, and abuse those just the same. Yes, sir. And, and to play off of that as well as they were warned when they asked for a king. 
Mm. God said, hey, yeah. this is what's going to happen. And so this is a little bit of that, hey, you reap what you sow. You ask for a king, he's messing up. So you have to suffer the consequences mm -hmm. of his failures because this is what you wanted. You wanted this king instead of being holy as your leader. You know how many times that uh, God could look down and say, I told you so, <laughs> right? Again and again and again. Paul, do you have something? Yeah, I was just thinking, I go along with what Ann said, is that, you know, obviously God has foreknowledge of what is, you know, our life going to be, you know, good decisions, poor decisions, and we have free will to make those. God knows what we're going to do with that free will and more knowledge of that, but we forget that it truly is free will to make good decisions or poor decisions. Mm -hmm. And that we can, it's not like we're, we're, going, we're on autopilot, so to speak, when you say, but when we're, okay, we're going to mess up, so that's okay because we know we're going to mess up and, and, and we have free will to not mess up, but we don't give enough credit sometimes to God and say, you can make the right decision tomorrow, and next week, and next year. Uh, even though I know what decision you're going to make, the free will is still yours. Yeah. Yeah, it's so on us. Don't discount the, the opportunity that God gives us to make the right decision. Mm -hmm. One of our... Uh instructors there at school he explained it as if you know we look at things as just a portion of what's happening right before our eyes and he used this example of standing you know up against the wall and it's bringing back memories now to Preston he heard it probably 14 times too but you're right up against the wall and you can only see what's right here whereas God is further back seeing the whole wall and everything that's going to take place he sees every bit of it and he knows what we're going to do but it does not negate the fact that we have that choice and hopefully, you know, we're making the right choices. I right, had Johnny, and then we'll come up here. I was just going to say, how many times could God tell somebody, as my dad used to say, I told you, I told you, I bought you books and sent you to school, and you still can't get it right. Right. I heard that a few times growing up. <laughs> Alex. always making the sacrifices that need to be made to continue to follow him. Absolutely. Uh, it is, you know, and it does seem as if he somewhat did get complacent. Uh, he got comfortable with where he was at and all kinds of problems. And it's just the same today. It'll happen to us in a hurry. All right. Now, um, this uh, Hadad it was mentioned in these verses, he flees to Egypt and he is with some of the servants of his father. And we're kind of going to get uh, get a little bit of this idea of how he kind of climbs the ladder. He's going to Egypt and he immediately receives some uh, grace even from Pharaoh and he's placed in a position to succeed very well there uh, in Egypt. Uh, if someone will, go ahead and read verses 18 through 24. Then they arose from Midian and came to Paran. And they took men with them from Paran and came to Egypt, to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who gave him a house, a portion of food for him, and gave him land. And Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh, so that he gave him as wife the sister of his own wife, that is, the sister of Queen Tapanese. Yeah. Then the sister of Tapanese bore him 
Virginia Bath, his son, from Coppinus, weaned in Pharaoh's house, and Virginia Bath was in Pharaoh's household among the sons of Pharaoh. So when Hadad heard in Egypt that David rested with his fathers, and that Joab, the commander of the army, was dead, Hadad said to Pharaoh, Let me depart, that I may go to my own country. Then Pharaoh said to him, But what have you lacked with me, that suddenly you seek to go to your own country? So he answered, Nothing, but do let me go anyway. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, if you know you're uh, a little bit of, as far as the layout, where the Red Sea is, and it comes up to the to the northern end of the Red Sea, and it kind of forks, and between those forks is what we recognize where the wilderness wandering took place, where Mount Sinai would be. Well, to the east side of that uh, east fork would have been Midian along the coast of that east side. So they leave from Midian, and then they work their way up and around the end of the Red Sea, which would have tied there to the Jordan. They come up around that, and then it says they went to Paran, and they picked up some men from there. So it's almost like they're circling, they're rounding, and they're working their way straight toward Egypt. They pick up some more men here in Paran, which is somewhere there in that wilderness wandering area. Then they work their way to Egypt. Now, for whatever reason, um, he is accepted right into Pharaoh's house. I don't know if that was something that happened very often there. We remember with uh, Moses, right? Um, as being someone as a baby, he was accepted. I don't know if that was just something that was common, but he's accepted. He's brought in to the point where even this Pharaoh, once this man has grown, he's received so much favor that even his own wife's sister is given to this man to be his wife. Then they have a child together. They have so much favor with Pharaoh that their child is weaned there in the house of Pharaoh, that he's raised there in the house of Pharaoh. So this man, Hadad, has been raised in a position to have some authority and to gain great wealth, to live very well. Now you tie it all the way back to what took place to his own people and the grudge that started because of the slaughter that took place. This is something that meant enough to him that now he's ready to go and do something about it. He realizes David is no longer serving. David is dead. He realizes Joab, the one who slaughtered all these people, he is also dead. Now, think about when that took place. What did David do as soon as he came in, or what did Solomon do not long after he came in to reign by David's instruction? Killed Joab, right? Now, that's all the way back at the beginning of the reign of Solomon. We're talking about now toward the latter part of the reign of Solomon. This has been some time, and now at the right time, in God's will and his plan, this adversary has been raised up against them, and he's willing to say, you know what? No, it's pretty nice here, Pharaoh, but I got business that I need to handle. Pharaoh, he's questioning like, well, what have you not had here? <laughs> what have I not supplied you? And he, he's basically saying, no, I've had it real good, but please let me depart and let me go take care of this matter. And that's exactly what he's going to do. He's going to leave there. There's our first adversary that's raised up against Solomon. Do we have time? We'll go ahead and read the next uh, three verses, verse 23 through 25. We may not get to discuss it much, but if someone will read verse 23 through 25. And God raised up another adversary against him. Rezon, the son of Eliadah, who had fled from his lord, Hadadezer, king of Zobah. So he gathered men to him and became captain over a band of raiders when David killed those of Zobah. And they went to Damascus and dwelt there and reigned in Damascus. One more verse. Now, he was an adversary of Israel all the days of Solomon, besides the trouble that Hadadah caused. And he abhorred Israel and, and reigned over Syria. Good job with those names. Those were the tougher names out of the whole text. You did those well. You did them really good. Um, so we have this one adversary that is raised up against Solomon. Now we're introduced to another one. And both of these are people from the past. Both of these are people who had problems with David who are just now showing this uh, desire to begin to cause problems for 
uh, Solomon and his kingdom. This individual is also mentioned there in 2 Samuel chapter 8 in the verses prior to um, the text that shows, I believe it's verses 12 through 14 in 2 Samuel chapter 8 that speak about um, Edom, whereas <coughs> verses 3 through 10, if I'm not mistaken, in 2 Samuel 8, talks about this, um, this man named Hadad Ezer, king of Zobah. Now, when these things took place there, basically there were men from Damascus who came and they tried to help them when David was coming against them, yet David defeated them. So, and it caused a problem, and it caused an enemy that just now festers. We'll jump back into that uh, next Wednesday. Thank you all for your attention.